start? Yeah. All right. So the next session is with the theme growth in altered landscape. With the enhanced growth demands and altered landscape, what are the strategies that air cargo stakeholders are adopting or are going to adopt to achieve this aggressive growth target? For this panel, we have our Vice President, Air Cargo Forum India, Mr. Yashpal Sharma, MD Skyways. Thank you. Yashpal is the MD of Skyways Group, which has grown to 11 companies in 27 cities in India and abroad in Germany, Vietnam, Bangladesh, with over 700 employees. The group's air freight company is in under his leadership has been recognized as the top freight forwarder in the country for several years now. Yash, as, as we call him, has been recognized and awarded for his leadership and entrepreneurial <laughs> drive. He's a graduate from University of Delhi and he's an active sports person and a dancer. Very warm welcome. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Vasudevan S., Partner and Global Sector Lead Airports for KPMG. He co-leads mobility and transport solutions for infrastructure clients, and he also leads aviation segment for KPMG. He has worked with several uh, airports like Maharashtra, Goa governments for Navi Mumbai, MOPA. He's advising no uh, Noida International Airport. He's actively involved with Airports Authority of India. And internationally also, he has advised Royal Thai Navy on a structuring of youth APAO airport transaction. And he's also working with the Civil Aviation Authority in Indonesia on Ankasapura 1 and several other airports in UAE and Abu Dhabi. A very warm welcome to Mr. Vasudevan. Next, we have uh, Mr. Camilo Garcia Cervera, Global VP Business Development for Web Cargo by Freitos, joining us virtually. He is an experienced air freight uh, senior executive with 20 years experience and he has worked in several geographies like Latin America, North America and Europe and he is managing the global commercial organization for a large international air carrier. Nowadays the global VP of business development at Web Cargo by Freitos, the industry's largest uh, e-booking platform and the rate management system. A warm welcome to Camilo joining us virtually. Next, I would like to invite Sri Keku Bhumi Gazdar, MD and CEO, Avia Pro Logistics. He was, um, he is the former CEO of I-Class 100% uh, subsidiary of Airports Authority of India. Prior to that, he has had a distinguished career for nearly three decades in various geographies like Middle East, South Asia, Indian region, with their various airlines, Saudi Arabian, Cargo, Air France, KLM, Martin Air. He is a uh, regularly awarded leader. So, very warm welcome to you, Mr. Gazdar. Next, I would like to invite Sri Motilal Sethi. Founder, Chairman and Managing Director of Saroj International Group of Companies. Manufacturer and, exports of, and exporter of high fashion leather garments, finished leather and fashion leather bags and leather accessories. He is the founding president of uh, Indian Leather Garment Association. And uh, besides actively being involved with the association, he also uh, has served as vice president of Indian Red Cross Society. Warm welcome to you, sir. Our, our last panelist is uh, Mr. Manoj Singh, Senior Vice President and Head Cargo, Mumbai International Airport Limited, Mial. Um, prior to joining Mial, he's had 29 years of rich experience in aviation on pan-India basis in cargo, ground handling management. He was earlier with uh, Menzies Aviation Boba Bangalore as the CEO. He's also worked with Menzies Aviation as a commercial manager, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. 
and has worked as general manager cargo and its startup greenfield projects in india both bangalore and hyderabad he's also worked with lufthansa cargo and airports authority of india warm welcome to you mr manoj large uh, round of applause for our wonderful panel and now i would hand over to mr yashpal sharma good afternoon ladies and gentlemen so the ones who are sleeping please raise your hands good thank you i appreciate it i'll shoot you down the moment i see that so we had a great start this morning with lots of bollywood action the minister joined in cyrus has taken a sabbatical from this industry and we've sent him off so the team of gina i saw a call he was thanking me thank god finally cyrus is gone <laughs> so uh, so yeah so we the minister joined in and then you know the first session we saw vipul singing a song the next session by sanjeev i don't know what happened they just missed bollywood totally so i've told my panel at the end of this this panel they're all going to dance all right so i will lead it for sure don't worry for sure so let's get started with things the moment in time is unique current circumstances demonstrate how vulnerable the economic system is and how connected people are to each other in every part of this planet the world is witnessing drastic changes in the environment in the technology in the economy as well as in the society business as usual is no longer usual and the question is how long the world can continue pursuing consumption growth and ever increasing look out for efficiency the world today has become extremely dynamic and witnessing economic changes one has not witnessed perhaps in the last 100 years last two years saw a few businesses coming to a grinding halt or almost coming to a grinding halt a few new ones coming up shining and also thriving the covid-19 altered the global manufacturing and consumption landscape from raw material production and pro procurement to new markets for product sales influenced by newer and altered demands of customers we heard uh, in the second panel today what uh, the gentleman from the textile industry spoke that you know their business came to a grinding halt and there was nobody who was probably looking to buy a formal shirt a tie a bow or definitely not a pant because we still started to do some virtual calls so maybe the upper attire was something that they were looking at but not the lower part of the attire the trade wars had started the china plus one discussion around the world from vietnam to morocco korea to mexico the world started to look for alternate manufacturing hubs brexit has seen an altered eu the lows and highs of fuel prices are making the world go mad the war in ukraine which has got us a very costly humanitarian crisis and also an economic damage which is bringing significant slowdown in global growth in 2022 and adding inflationary pressures on most economies of the world including india to navigate and survive the transformative change every business is trying to harness all the skills creativity imagination that they can muster sustainability of supply chain is the buzzword last 24 months it's not the cheapest production it is the sustainability of production which is the keyword india which has been seen as a strong alternate to china for large production and has been making strides in various products to be the producer of choice for the global buyers and consumers from traditional automotive pharma agri textiles we are now also seeing electronics semiconductor giga factories big push on evs and manufacturing of some of the other products today's rapidly evolving manufacturing technologies including artificial intelligence and advanced robotics and the internet of things collectively referred to as an industry 4.0 technologies are poised to reshape the global manufacturing landscape with important consequences for the traditional role of manufacturing in economies and even job creation the world as we know or we knew has been altered and the economies and businesses of the world are finding newer dynamic and sustainable ways to grow in this new world our panel which is going to talk today about growth in this altered world is a very august panel 
very very interesting panel thank you uh, parul for introducing them to me to everybody so i don't need to do that again but we i have a very diversified panel who comes in from the industry from the carrier from the airports from the tech world uh, i have just about everybody at there and we have somebody from the consulting background also with a uh, lot of gyan please my excuse my humor i will have i'll have some absolutely absolutely meaningful so uh, ladies and gentlemen let me let me start by uh, you know putting putting a few things to you hi camilo uh, i see you there nice to see you so uh, you know there there have been a lot of uh, political economic territorial changes which are affecting the world so what as per each one of you i will ask you to have an opening comment on how do you see the key changes in global landscape which are affecting manufacturing consumption storage or even movement of goods so let me start by with the airport so let me let me go over straight off to him he was feeling more sleepy so i thought i'll catch him first he said i'll be last because i'm sitting last so you have started dancing much faster than expected <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be part of this ACFA forum. It's it's fantastic. It's my first uh, uh, so first time I've been you know attending this forum, and uh, thanks to Arvind and Yash uh, to invite me, and of course the chairman Cyrus. Uh, yes, the topic was given uh, just two days back, and I said any topic uh, which is something very quantified and much where we can speak more. with clarity and much more or not on the macro level more on uh, jargons uh, i would prefer to be more specific and to the point so uh, the point uh, what uh, yash was mentioning about what has been a big change uh, or what needs to be uh, there has been a complete uh, shift in decorum of uh, overall uh, government thought process uh, that's where we are in a very very positive environment so we we hats off to uh, lucky people out here that this was not the era of in 90s where we were all not collaborating together but today it's all about right from the ministry level that thought was you have seen what the minister mentioned about underdogs to super dogs so that was something very very uh, all equivalents to all the stakeholders out here so uh, that's the first change i would say so uh, again not on the topic where you know mentioned about super dog but why super dog i i believe uh, there are a lot of things which have been done in last 5 years uh, you see the the fta agreement the free trade agreement which you know there there has to be enabler we talk about airport we talk about processes transshipment we discuss yes that's the topic which we need to really work on the micro level but what's what are the enablers i i happened to meet our new chairman uh, mr gautam nama adani and uh, i had 20 minutes of time where you know first time when he came to cargo facility at mumbai airport and he see saw the the first pharma facility of, uh, of the largest airport based facility and he he was mentioning about the numbers because he was so fast on the numbers he said we don't have to look for uh, this facility this facility is bound to come what are we doing on the manufacturing side what are we trying to enable what kind of support we need to do we have to look from not from china perspective or not from any other perspective we are far better in terms of skill knowledge so we have to think about that this thing will be you will you will have to develop a 10 more terminals out at the airport so that's a vision i mean uh, you're thinking next 30 years or 40 years of vision so that's where you know i'm coming from uh, that perspective that how as an airport we have to create a capacity but you know uh, the fta agreement really brought a lot of integrations in terms of open economic policies and integration between countries but on the other end what has happened the covid really and disconnected act so there was a disbalance between these uh, enablers which we are trying to really connect country to country in terms of agreements and uh, sociology and trying to connect on the integrations of uh, doing business but covid really kept into the shell and that's where these two things had really made a big changes to us but you know incentive scheme what we mentioned about uh, these are the point not from the airport perspective from the policy perspective it is a, a giving us a good side but uh, trying to connect that you know uh, the ease of doing business but the manufacturing cell unit which now we have realized in the covid period the impact of one country which was producing all across china it has given an opportunity to us now today 
uh, Ukraine issue which is happening, you will see 80% of you know uh, the wheat production uh, comes from Ukraine and Russia. The whole of Af Africa is impacted now. Now because of that impact, there is a pressure on the other countries who are producing and supplying those countries. So there has been a cascading effect. So there has been change. These dynamic when changes, we should as a country should take the opportunity to really grab it. And today now you can see what's happened in Sri Lanka in the last few weeks. It's a big impactful uh, issues which are happening. What is happening? The, the, there is a complete uh, turmoil of the whole country and there is a lot of huge demands coming in. It's not about taking the opportunity of it. We as a neighboring country needs to support, but there are other countries, the competitors have really taken a lot of niche of that particular country's key elements of the business. Now we have to grab it, take it back and try to deliver that. So if you see the hubs of uh, countries like you know Singapore or Hong Kong, or for that matter, Dubai, uh, I would say from the right end to the left end, there has been a shift change. Uh, inefficiency, I would say, or rather a bottlenecks of Indonesia or neighboring countries is an opportunity for Singapore to develop, and they have developed it, right? And their 90% of the production house or the transshipment or any transportation on the logistics or you talk about any, any uh, transformation of ocean and air freight is all about the capacity building be, uh, because of Singapore. And now today, when we have an opportunity to be in India, we have lost that opportunity. Now the time, global, it, it's a very critical time for us to really redevelop that and try to see our neighboring countries we will be the big brothers for them, support them, so that we become our niche product for hub management of all types of uh, products which we can produce and distribute and you know deliver on the logistics. Right? That's what mine. Thank you, Manoj. Um, I totally agree. The opportunity is here for us to grab. Uh, you know, China's been almost shut down for last couple of months. Raw material has been a big constraint for many many suppliers around the world. Finished products are a big big issue. And all these challenges, it opens up a lot of opportunity for India. And when you say that Mr. Gautam Adani visited you and he was saying that, you know, we are better than everybody, everybody knows, you know, Mumbai Airport, despite all the constraints, despite its size, delivers probably one of the finest amounts or tons of cargo throughput through the year. So definitely there's... Tons per kilogram. Yeah. Superb, superb. So... 10 tons. So, uh, Vasu, let me go over to you and uh, you know get some some thoughts from you on possible disruptions and new changes that you see around the world. Yeah, thank you, uh, Yash. And first of all, thanks to the organizers for considering me to be part of this August panel. Got some heavy weights around me, and also I think online, uh, Camilo is there. Uh, but let me just keep it uh, short because I think we will have other issues to discuss in detail. For me, I think three things have defined how uh, global economics or politics has changed. I think if you look at the last 10 years, the pace of change, not just on economic growth, but also in terms of how the philosophy of politics has changed globally, has been quite sharp and accentuated. And you look at any part of the world, I think most people, by default, the ones who are wanting to see that change and transform for the benefit of their own sovereign uh, status, are now focusing on policies and uh, interventions and positioning, which are all driven by personal uh, importance or self-reliance, uh, right? Yeah. And that's one. I think that also, in a sense, has given India an opportunity, in my view, because while we have our own version of Atmanirbhartha, which I think has its, uh, you know, challenges as well in terms of looking at uh, cargo growth potential. Uh, I think it has now become an I mean, a, a, a statement that many governments are making with, res with respect to how they want to redefine those, those economies, right? And that's important because that the geopolitics today is opening up new opportunities for countries like India and China. That's number one. Number two, I think we've been over-obsessed with this whole issue about India versus China. And if I take a long-term view, I mean, let's look at it this way. We're part of the Quad, and we have an important role to play in world politics today. We are now being recognized as one of the important economic powers globally. And new FTAs are being signed with countries that we probably would not very, uh, were not very successful doing business with in the past. What does this show? That while there is a lot of focus on India, there is also a lot of focus from the traditional Western powers on looking at this geography in Asia-Pacific. 
as being the ones or the countries being in this space as the ones driving future business, right? And therefore, I think rather than looking at this India-China equation as an adversarial force, we also have to see that opportunity because all that has been discussed in terms of crisis, in terms of our uh, advantages, you know, emerging out of countries or neighbors having problems, are short term. They will go away in the next two, three years. And, you know, everybody has a solution to these problems. But I think in our own interest, I think it's important to now find ways of doing more commerce with our neighbors. And I think China should be one of them in some form. And I think that's happening quietly. Uh, Manoj yeah, will acknowledge yeah. that, and so will other airport operators here. And as long as we keep that focus on economics more than politics, I think we have a lot more to gain through that partnership. And that's the second point I wanted to make. And the third is, I think we've spoken enough about infrastructure, and the minister was very right in saying we have to dream big. And being a super dog, I don't know if it's the right term to use. But the fact is, he has obviously set out the ambition to say that, look, he sees potential and he believes that we can get there. I'm a firm believer that India should be doing a lot more. For two simple reasons, even if you do a quick comparison of the countries which handle the maximum air freight alone today. And while many of them are stark examples of transshipment hubs, you mentioned about Singapore, there is Dubai, there is, of course, Hong Kong. Of course, they benefit from the fact that they become global transshipment hubs. But we also have the examples of Korea in Shanghai, right? And Korea is a great example to point out in, in a forum like this because they have a GDP of what, 1.6, 1.7 trillion dollars, way ahead of uh, Brazil and uh, Russia as well. And they're getting close to Canada. But they, I think, did about 3.3 million tons of cargo for a country of that size in terms of geography and manufacturing capability. And that, I think, gives us some lessons in terms of saying why we believe we should, or why we should think that we are underperforming. And today, when we are at three, I think our aspiration should be four times more, at the least, because we have examples to show that it is possible, even though it's a manufacturing kind of nation. And the fact that India today has the infrastructure which it is creating, in terms of new airports, in terms of new facilities at various terminals, also should give us confidence that if we fix the process issues more than the infrastructure issues, and we are able to, in a sense, find a solution to what I think the Honorable Minister rightly pointed out as the need to aggregate cargo. And it essentially that meant domestic transshipment in a much bigger fashion because you're just now trying to integrate tier three with tier two. I think we will well be on that journey to hitting that six million mark soon and probably double it in the next uh, five to 10 years. And that's my view. Great points, uh, I, I must say that. Yes, definitely the opportunity is very much there when we compare ourselves to a country like South Korea. Uh, when you say three million, uh, that's largely international business. While in India, what we're talking about 3.2 or 3.3 million, we're talking about uh, domestic as well as part of it, So, which comprises almost one third of the total business. So definitely the opportunity is there. We all, we all totally understand and it's the pace of change that we need to set right and the processes. Uh, once those small alterations in the processes are done, uh, we definitely will be on our way. So good, let me go international. Let me go to Espanol. Uh, Camilo. Let us hear from you. Well, how do you see an altered world out there? Uh, we need to get a little bit of a global perspective to our, to our session today. So how do you see the altered world around you? Thank you, Josh. Uh, good afternoon to yourself, uh, to the entire forum, and to the organizers for hosting me today. It's a real pleasure to be able to contribute to this panel with a, view, a bit of a view from an international and a digital perspective. So to your point, uh, Josh, um, let me just go back. What we were faced with 24 months ago, 26 months ago now, was unprecedented for everyone in the world and also for the logistics industry. We were challenged by the world and expected by the world to change the way in which supply chain work. In a matter of days, we were expected to transport PPE uh, equipment around the world, saving lives, started carrying vaccines, to again save lives, but we were doing this with shortages in scheduled flights, shortages in manpower from an airport perspective, handling agents perspective, all sorts of, of challenges, skyrocket rates, and we were forced to do business in a way different to what we knew it was. The good thing is that I think as an industry, we did it. Nowadays, logistics and air freight in this case are recognized by the world in a much better and strong way compared to what we did 24 months ago. So now we're in the spotlight. 
And I would say that from a positive perspective. Because finally, an industry, if I take it only from an air cargo perspective, which is worth perhaps 80, 90 billion dollars, is now recognized by the industry and the economy overall, but the true value that it brings to society. Having said that, we also see some components of our industry which are not necessarily managed in such a way. And in order to achieve the vision of 2030, some of that will need to change. Part of that through digitization, through technology, but we need to start ensuring that we bring air cargo and logistics overall, not as a different animal, not like life in a different planet. Sometimes I've heard through, through my career how uh, we as members of the, of the industry have said, well, it doesn't work like this in logistics. Well, that only would work for the travel uh, industry. At the end, and my point here, Josh, is that what we are seeing in the, in the last two years and will transform the way in which we act uh, going forward is that we have seen an even more accelerated change in which, customer pay, in, in which customers purchase goods. And by customer, I'm referring to forwarders, to shippers, and to individual consumers. And sadly, we will find ourselves that people will purchase capacity, will purchase logistic services in a similar way in which we purchase banking services, insurance services, health services, travel services. We're not a different planet. We're part of this planet. Let's realize that. And we are a key component of what we're having. So very excited of what is ahead of us. I think the future is absolutely bright for logistics with huge challenges in front of us, but none of them which will be impossible to overcome. I think we have shown to the world what we can do. We will need to find ways in, in order to work different and work better together. For me, I think it's important that we change some of the concepts that have uh, been uh, dominating the industry. Sharing is important in order to grow faster. And we would like to make sure that as an industry, we embrace shared technology as a key way to accelerate the process of digitization in the logistics industry. Great. Thank you, Camilo. Uh, interesting point. So you laid emphasis on two things. One is the purchaser will define how the world is going to be, uh, even in the world of logistics. And you also spoke about Uberization once again, the shared, when you talk about shared capacities and, you know, we heard that in the morning session as well. Uh, Dr. Ravi Mathur talking about Uberization. I don't know if he's here. But uh, he spoke about it as well. So, so yes, uh, sharing of available resources that will optimize things for sure will be definitely interesting. So before I go to the customer, let me, before he goes to sleep, I'll catch him. Uh, so the world has been hugely altered, right? I mean, we're seeing shipping lines becoming airlines, becoming a big threat probably, uh, perceived threat to carriers on the air side in times to come. So how do you see from your side, what, are the, what is the altered world like uh, over the last two years and what do you see in the near future? Uh, thank you, Yash. Good afternoon, everybody. So um, post-COVID, we enter a new world order in logistics. Clear? Yep. Okay. So first, post-COVID, there's a new world order in uh, logistics. And whatever we've done so far in life, will be a fragment of what we're going to do here and for. Very briefly, there will be three key points that are going to determine the way forward. And these are the three abilities that each of us, either together as an organization, as a forum, or individually will need to be prepared for. One is adaptability. The second is accessibility. And the third is actability. I don't know if that's a word, but that's something I'll point up later. These three are going to determine exactly how we're going to take logistics forward, whether we are an airline, a forwarder, a terminal operator, a customs house agent, whoever it may be. As Fushi mentioned this morning, and I, I it was a little experience that I had working alongside the ministry for the past five years. There's a clear shift between being reactive to situation to be proactive in situation. And that was clearly exemplified during the COVID. Uh, if all of us sitting here had food to eat uh, fresh, 
uh, during the COVID period. If all of us have got vaccinated twice, hopefully during the last couple of years, uh, pat on all your back because it was only air cargo that did it. No one else was able to do it other than all of us sitting here. And this, 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 I personally give credit to the minister himself for leading from the front to ensure that none of us had a complaint about any issue. Yeah, we had challenges. Make no mistake about it. There were a huge amount of challenges in getting food across or PP across, etc. But as terminal operators, nobody closed. As airline operators, no one stopped flying. As forwarders, nobody stopped working. As custom house agents, nobody said, oh, you know what? Uh, it's too dangerous. I don't think as an industry we heard that. And compared to the other industries around us, I think, in my view, that just shows the importance. Uh, someone asked me the other day, if you could describe uh, the last two years, how do you describe it in a sentence? And I said, Ekago saved the world. That's all it did. Ekago saved the world. What I see going forward would be, again, very specifically moving from being company-centric or country-centric to being customer-centric, okay? There is no more going to be one shoe fits all. There is no more going to be, look, this is what I do. This is the way I do business. You like it, good, you don't like it, bad, no. The customer is going to say, this is what I want, okay? Are you able to provide me that? This is where we are going to head towards. As far as the teams are concerned, or the PLIs, et cetera, the opportunities, they were there in the past, they have come up now, they will be there in the future as well. I think what's important for us as a community uh, would be to identify these opportunities way before they surface. That would be the key element that will define us in the future. Do I know what's the next big product uh, 10 years from now? I don't know. Could be flowers in this uh, country. But 10 years ago, I didn't know that vaccines or pharma is going to have such a big impact. So it, it's evolving. Uh, I have a crystal ball on my table, and for the last uh, 25 years, I still couldn't find an answer from that crystal ball anytime I ask a question. So hopefully things will change. But uh, going forward, I think. Focus is going to be one key important point. Thank you. Thank you, Kegul. I think before asking the crystal ball, you should have spoken to your wife. Maybe the crystal ball would have spoken, but uh, luck by chance, that didn't happen. Yes, yes, yes. So, no, yes, Air Cargo saved the world. That's true. Absolute bang on. Uh, we as an industry were there to move things from one part to the other when, you know, every other means of transport was a no-go. And uh, and uh, kudos to the entire industry for that. Uh, your points were very well said that you know the world tomorrow is unknown, and an early mover advantage or a first mover advantage would make a difference. Whenever you get a get an opportunity, the ones who grab to become a sanitizer making company from probably making uh, perfumes so good. If you were make, if you're into a in a textile industry and you started making masks and other PPE kits. And you started doing that early, good for you. So, so yes, of course, the world is changing and, and we don't know how long it's going to last, but, but you must be there too and your systems need to be adaptive and agile to be able to adapt into something that, that's going to come for tomorrow. So, so good. So let, let us go, to, go over to the customer, you know. So since everybody's been talking customer-centric, customer-centric. So, so let's go over to Motilalji and, you know, hear from him, you know, how does he see the auto world? Because, you know, suddenly manufacturing became a big challenge, you know, from... We, we always speak about hub and spoke system in uh, logistics, but I think it is time that the manufacturing uh, starts to look at hub and spoke manufacturing or, you know, probably storing because today you can't think of manufacturing in one part of the world. You can't think of even manufacturing in multiple parts of the world. So what's the right answer? You know, the government is doing a lot. Uh, we've been talking about the PLI schemes, the FTAs and many, many more things that the government is trying to push. So how do you see, sir? What is the altered world like and what can we expect tomorrow? Good afternoon and first of all, thank you very much for having me here in your session. Air Cargo uh, Forum 
is really doing. I was very impressed to hear the minister and hear Mr. Cyrus in the morning. Yash. And Cyrus, rightly, you said it was a Bollywood star, which was very good. And when post lunch, I was asking whether the post lunch session people will be sleeping. I said, no, the moderator, <laughs> the chosen moderator, will not let anybody sleep. And I think you just mentioned to him he was not sleeping, he was very attentive. So, with all these words, I would like to take it forward that all this, I think it's a very interesting se session. And as I'm addressing here, Cargo, all of you are fraternity members. I would say that we are passing through in the airlines when you're sitting and traveling long haul flight. We are passing through an air turbulence period. This is a, but we will have a very safe landing. India has got a very positive approach towards everything. This turbulences, which we can see today, the war in Ukraine, China not working, are all temporary phase, but India is looking at opportunities out of all these things. What is happening around the world? India is being looked upon with very big respect. And I think Indian entrepreneurs, the way they are working, the continuity, the kind of hard work that they are doing, the partnerships with the government, the assurance of the government, we should be encashing on all these things in this global scenario. So here I would like to say that, of course, these turbulences and the global realignment of supply chain is happening but while all this is happening we have seen investments in the last three weeks i would like to share with all of you that nike has come to chennai and established like four factories to india which is a very good sign mm -hmm. i mean which is very very an encouraging sign in the, these circumstances that we are getting we have been you know banging on the doors of various uh, countries in the past for inviting foreign investment in India. But I would like to say that the opportunity is there. China plus one, that theory of the world today, is talking and looking India as, an open, as, as a destination, as a reliable destination. So I think when you are talking about your 10 million, that's the target that we are talking about today, as an industry, as a representative of the industry, Yash has been very smart in inviting me. He has given me a responsibility to the industry that unless we grow, you will not be able to grow. So Absolutely. I think it's a partnership. So we as an industry have got a major responsibility and by inviting me here, I think I'll be carrying the message as a regional chairman of Council for Leather Export. We are doing, we are an industry which is doing about $18 billion in the city. Out of $400 billion of uh, merchandise export, we have got a very major... Uh, portfolio. So here I think the industry partnership with the logistic, logistic is very, very important. And what we are finding today in today's scenario, the logistic, we used to say, we were just not taking it that seriously, but the government with Gati Shakti, with the government schemes, with the importance, the logistic of late, all the manufacturing has realized that importance of logistic. And I think I would like to say here, that now nobody else can feel the, the, the kind work which uh, my colleagues have just spoken. During the course of pandemic, we have had and we have seen all you stakeholders deserve a very special hand and special compliment from all of us that you did remarkably well in not only, you know, in providing things, essentials during this thing, and your performance has been one of the factors that India, despite such a populated country, we have been able to overcome even the oxygen has been transported by the air car. I think we, you all deserve a very special hand for all this. I would like to you know, record it that your, your efforts have been very good. Yash has been posting me all these things and it was remarkably a service above all those commercial things that you have been doing. So coming to the global, uh, uh, global interventions and global uh, territorial disturbances, I would say one thing that India today is being looked upon. We need to be really focusing on our efforts. And while he, we are talking about manufacturing, I would like to take this forward because there are a lot of things which are happening. The FTA, I was uh, with the Honorable Minister in Dubai. And I would like to say that not only the government is signing the agreements today on 10th of uh, May in Chennai, the mandate from the Piyush Goel is that go and educate the industry and today we had the first session in Chennai, even the Council for Leather Export was there. 
to educate the exporters and the general industry as to what are the benefits, how we can write the benefits of these FTAs. So even after a week, we are going to have such in the northern region in Agra also. Government is very proactive and as the Honorable Minister said this morning, I think we should be, they were words were very encouraging. We should partner with the government, not on a square table, I think on a round table, what he said, it's very well said. And yes, I think you must have given a little brief to the minister this morning. Not really. <laughs> made it from a square to a round table. So with all these words, I would like to take this forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Motilal ji. Thank you. They are very encouraging words. Firstly, to know, know Nike has come up and set up four factories in uh, in Chennai, which is very heartening to know. Any major addition to manufacturing in India is absolutely great, and I'm I'm so glad. And like what Vasu said, you know, uh, till the time we keep the uh, political things aside and we let the economics drive us, I think we are in a good space. Uh, the political stuff is done. It's about economics, and that's what where we all come into the picture, and we must get that into action. Absolutely. I'll so, charge. I'll charge you. I think we heard from all, but we haven't heard of all. All right. <laughs> so let's hear from Yash as a forwarder, not as a moderator. As a forwarder, what is your perspective? So for a forwarder, uh, I think it's we've been in a very very brilliant space. I think uh, for a forwarder, I think this last two years was a terrain cast made for us. Because I think uh, freight forwarders always thrive on uh, customization, difficult trains. We are we are always in a complex world. We are absolutely the last person just before the uh, you know the goods get inside the door or you know they are thrown open, and and usually uh, the stakeholders before us and after us are late. <laughs> My apologies if I am hurting somebody. So we are the ones who are covering up for it. So we are actually customized, designed by God. to be sent down here to to work in scenarios which are complex so the last two years of complexity was actually pretty much made for us and i think freight forwarding community made a good use of it uh, they 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 bought in solutions they uh, they bought in uh, multimodal solutions from various parts of the world we we gave uh, different options to customers uh, whether it was for stocking of goods or whether it was for movement of goods both ways i think we we gave them uh, probably storage which was closer to the point of production at times and even at times closer to the point of sale and at times in a third third place which has nothing to do with both these places so 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 i think we've been we've been designing a lot of customized solution which has been great and i think the freight forwarders also uh, came down to a ground zero we came at par so there was no big forwarder no small forwarder there was you know no multinational no local forwarder so we were all at ground zero when everything came to a grinding halt at uh, end of march and and we all had an opportunity to to rise up and probably do things differently and a lot of them outshined and performed so so that's why you see new players new players around and so forwarders i think are looking at the world very very uh, excitedly it's a very exciting times though uh, especially on the shipping side there's sorry but a little bit of a monopolistic view that we see as a forwarder there where the shipping lines are not very encouraging on the forwarder side and i think it's for some it's for customers also to uh, look at that it's possibly a threat for their business going forward you know that if you only have a few set of carriers uh, running this world then you're not going to have a cost benefit or even efficiencies you nobody will be there to listen to you so so air is a good good place to be in for for customers air freight rocks air freight rocks so so thank you for the out of syllabus question thank you i appreciate it yeah so so let me let me let me get into manufacturing since you know that's the that's the core that's the heart of our discussion today because like you said sir that if manufacturing can do if they can manufacture then we all will get our share you know the airports the airlines the forwarder the brokers we'll all get our share if your if the pie grows and uh, while india still is at 1.9% of global trade you know we just at 1.9% despite the hype that we're talking about manufacturing since morning uh, the manufacturing has actually had a dip in the share of the gdp of the country you know we were at about 16% in 2012 and we are at 13 and a half percent today so uh, so that that doesn't mean the manufacturing could have gone down it means the other products have possibly done well so uh, let me go to you asu uh, to get a little different perspective that you know uh, do you see a shift in commodity profiles in the second session there was the uh, the panel was talking about that you know we need newer commodities possibly to move by air Uh, do you do you think there is a possible commodity shift that we could see, and what does an industry or a government can do to facilitate this shift? 
I think the short answer to the question, which I think all of you in this room are aware of, is just cost, right? And I don't think it's so much the product profile. Of course, it is changing, uh, as uh, Motilalji pointed out. There is obviously the opportunity, but I think uh, your biggest competitor today, as everybody would agree, is the shipping sector, notwithstanding the inefficiencies on the challenges that you have, for the simple reason, and as I think uh, Dr. Mathur had pointed out in, in the morning session, even accepting the fact that shipping costs have gone up three times, the differential between shipping freight costs and air freight is today about four and four and a half times at least. So I think that's not going to change in a hurry. And uh, as we discussed just now, uh, even though you have supply side constraints today, whether it's ships or containers or a vessel being stuck somewhere or productions or ports being shut down, uh, as we heard from uh, Motilalji, it's, uh, it's something that will ease itself out slowly in the next couple of years. And I don't think any strategy of ours should be based on short-term constraints. And we've seen across the board, we spoke about, Keku spoke about uh, how well we did. And that also shows that as an industry globally, it's very resilient. We've gone through the airline business or aviation business has gone through several crises in the past. And you can name them right from 2001. We've had many black swan, so-called black swan events. But the fact is that we've come back stronger each time. And this time is no different as well. So I think a changing product profile is certainly useful in terms of value. And I think it's good for the country because, again, as we build more infrastructure, we can design them to handle these newer products as well. But I think the one differentiating feature which will make it succeed in terms of volumes or scale or growth, which is the theme of this panel, is how do you become more productive and therefore how do you make sure that you're competitive on costs. And if that happens, frankly, we will have the choice of either sending it by sea or by air, right? And, and that's the ideal situation that we would all be in, whether it's a freight forwarder or a shipper or an airline. I think there's no easy answer to that. But I think uh, more than actually looking at uh, you know, the constraints in manufacturing, if you're even able to address 50% of the problem on the logistics side in terms of costs, or in terms of how efficiently we handle cargo both within airports and outside, including last mile, which will become an important uh, factor even with PLIs, and that's one of the challenges that we are seeing today. And we would have straight uh, forward uh, address the issue of cost. And that is going to translate into significant long-term value. I hope I've answered that question. Sure, you. I mean, the cost factor, uh, well, you're right that, you know, today's uh, cost differential between air freight and ocean freight is four to five times. But let me put it in the right perspective that it used to be eight to ten times. So, so air freight is definitely still far more attractive than what it was. So, so don't blame us. Blame the ocean freight carriers. They've become more expensive than the air cargo, right? So, we're, we're, doing, we're in a good space. Yeah. I also think that there's another important point which I think somebody else raised in the previous panel or probably came up through my conversations over lunch. This is the inventory holding cost. And that yeah. completely distorted the picture, right? And maybe that's one reason why we believe that, you know, there's still a distinct advantage there. But I think that's a problem that will remain depending on how many new crises will come in the future. And I think it's, COVID has taught us a very big lesson that we need to be prepared. And therefore, I think the obsession with holding slightly larger inventories, in fact, substantially higher today, is actually completely changing the perception on costs as well. And maybe that there's a story there for us as the air freight industry to take advantage of. Can we now create a system of checks and balances which will ensure that just-in-time happens whenever you want it, irrespective of what crisis we hit in the future? And if the industry can find an answer, you solve the 90% uh, uh, of the cost issue. Till two years ago, just-in-time was most famous for, for most of the manufacturers around the world, most of the buyers around the world. But, you know, I think it's a, it's a, world, it's a word that, you know, the, the owners of those manufacturers don't want to hear for now because they don't want a disruption in their supply chains. They really need things to happen. And stocking, uh, yes, stocking can change. And, and how effectively, when, when you look at the idling cost of your product, which is roughly about 6% of... Uh, the logistics cost that we talk about or the product cost 6%. If you negate that 6% out of your business and you transform that into air freight, you would have a faster lead time, faster cycle. That's what, you know, when Cyrus spoke in the morning about an H&M or a Zara, etc., using that as a model to boost their business, the more that the customers also, the manufacturing and the buyers need to get more adaptive into how they accept and collaborate with air freight will make a lot of difference. 
let me let me go over to motilal ji you know so since we are talking about growth in manufacturing so you know about 2.5% share of uh, leather garment in the global trade you are doing better than the overall india average at 1.9% so how do you think we can go to say 4% or 5% in years in in the leather leather garments we are a 400 billion dollar industry globally and the business is driven on fashion and various factors around the globe so leather being a product which is expensive product has got a big market also because leather has got its own natural characteristics and despite having so many alternates to leather leather still holds a very prominent position in the consumers eyes i would like to say that on the manufacturing side a lot of things are already taking place in india the government is very very proactive and as far as uh, manufacturing is concerned the overall package in india we are still expensive the cost part was just discussed i fully endorsed it to my speaker on my left he said rightly that costing has got to be taken care of because the world at large is looking towards india but these opportunities will slip if we do not become cost efficient today so we will not be able to end cash on our this uh, shift of business from overseas unless every single input on our costing is taken care of where logistic cost inventory cost are also equally important so today i would like to say from this forum that on the on you see i am with the yash like you know on the logistic front in our high fashion garments they become perishable as perishable as those fruits and vegetables that you are talking about in case of fashion product if there is a delay they have got to be bailed out only by air freight and always i have been remembering that in my times yes this has to be done otherwise there will be cancellation so those costs have gone very high and in fact what we should try to have open sky policy which was being mentioned there should be more operators in the country in the times to come they should be invited by the government through whatever ways they can so that we have got more availability of air cargo space and there are more operators that is one thing which can really bring down the costing of air freight which is a very important component because whatever said and done in the fashion industry what you're talking about zara to control the inventory system to make it more efficient uh, availability of product air shipments cannot be substituted by ocean freight there has to be there will be always a demand in the fashion industry for air cargo so those that cost has got to be taken on in in uh, in i would like to come also to the imports because a lot of imports are being done for the purpose of export and the lead times are getting lesser and shorter so even imports we have to depend a lot on the air cargo and those have got to be very efficiently handled the next point is there in the imports also we are finding it's very very expensive for us so you know co covering both the cost we have got to be very efficient while coming to the manufacturing we were we are representing government every day and the government is really concerned giving a boost to the manufacturing the manufacturing services which are attached if we go to the chinese model they were not giving you a fish they were not giving you cash incentives but there were a lot of built in things which were being done and here i would like to say that there should be a uniform policy wherever we are talking of inland containers policy from state government one state government to another state government those hand holdings which i am talking of manufacturing services are differing some governments are you know keeping a cap now imagine in a landlocked place where would you how would you send your containers to the port so state governments are having a policy but it should be a uniform policy that okay such and such amount will be given and that is what i am talking about manufacturing services should be provided to the manufacturers in india so that we become cost efficient eventually the point is you are we are all talking about three things which we are understanding from your this thing stimulating today morning we have been talking of assets in our manufacturing like in for achieving your 10 billion 10 million you have talked about these three s and the minister was talking of s i would also add in manufacturing we use three things skill scale and speed now our speed in india is still very poor we are not able to you know deliver most of our merchandise is late for whatever reason it could be because the imports are delayed it could be the clearances it could be the workforce uh, environment it could be the the supply chain so there are a lot of reforms which are requiring in manufacturing 
And if really we want to come up to those international standards, we got to be really looking at every single factor. And we recently had a debate amongst our manufacturers that, look, the business is coming towards India. We got to be encashing on it. How do we really do it? So a lot of things are already happening in it. And as I rightly said, it's a partnership. Logistic is very important. If we grow, definitely the logistic will grow. And we need each other as partners. So very importantly, your role is very good. I'm very glad that I'm here today and heard all of you. It is very, very important for our industry on both ends. And we definitely need whatever support lines are required for logistics or whatever representations are required from the industry forums also. We would like to take this mission forward. So that's what I just want to say, that in manufacturing, logistics is very much a part of us. And we need to be you know, furthering it by whatever ways we can and try to take the manufacturing in a bigger manner because as opportunities are coming, there are many more. I'm told even sketches are now after this Nike story, sketches are coming. So likewise, there will be a lot many more people who are really looking at India today. And India, it's I think a very right time for us to be partnering. And there are assurances from the government. The government is making a lot of assurances, but I think practically it has to be also shaping up very, very, very well. So I think we need to be completely and regularly knocking at the door of the government and see that it's really shaping up whatever government is talking about and our intervention has got to be there. That round table concept which was talked, I'm really again repeating it, that round table must continue, the industry must go very openly to the government and see that whatever government is talking or whatever we are talking, whatever professionals are talking, the synergies are all in shape. Otherwise, we lose this opportunity of manufacturing shift to India. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Sethi. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's very rightly put that, you know, it's the collaborative effort of the government, the, in, the industry, as well as logistics that can actually make it happen. And uh, to, to make in India, we have to, uh, you know, get all forces together to join hands and, and do it for us. Let me just go over to Manoj, uh, asking you, you know, what is the commodity shift that you are seeing being an airport? So, you know, you have, you're, a, you're very well positioned to see, you know, what is the air cargo commodity shift that we are seeing now? And do you think it's sustainable in the future? I would talk on the other sense. I need to retain the goods which are of a cargo mode. I think that's the first thing we need to do. The reason is we are sh seeing a shift of a product which has a capacity constraint and you know it's converting into a C mode. And everyone is going to watch for it. I'm sure yes, you being from the freight work industry, you've seen, I'll give an example of just 10 years back. We had pharmaceutical, which was not to name those companies, they were shifting around 70% of cargo by air cargo mode. Now it's reverse. So what do I do? I have to retain first my air cargo product. That's a step number one. Step number two is the products which are moving by air, because of the capacity, they're just holding the country's consumption, not getting exported. The third, the agro, I would say very bluntly, and the agro product, they're not getting space. Uh, and rather, I would say, uh, someone mentioned about uh, one of the places where beaches were exported, right? Uh, there are multi Darbanda. products in India waiting for a cargo mode to really get them shipped out to, 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 to the world, I would say. The uh, reason I'm telling you, because I had been to a few of the sessions where I connected with all the MSMEs. Uh, in Thane Belt, there were 600 companies, small niche production houses, and I had been, you know, three or four forums where I had really been discussing with them. They say, you know, uh, we don't get, you know, uh, great support from my cargo industry. So we wanted to go with, uh, along with the customs, we went for the AO certification. So and why I'm trying to be very practical in approach is what is the reality we need to really talk about and let's quantify and make that actionable points. Uh, those MSMEs are waiting, as you mentioned about uh, what support is needed. Uh, within the state government, there's a lot of challenges. Of course, the warehousing and logistics have main advantage of GST implementation. That's a game changer. 2017, 18, when it launched GST, that has now been a centralized and very crystallized process of you know uh, taxation policies have come. So that's one of the biggest steps the government of India has taken, and you know that's being controlled well. Uh, but 
these small players who are basically the your epicenter of your economy you know the, the small players who are manufacturing and exporting they're not getting support in terms of i would say multi issues are there but there are few things which we need to uh, as an ecosystem of our logistic player be it the airport or the freight forwarders i think they we all have to reach them actually because there are so many exporters are not aware how do they export and uh, as you mentioned what are the commodities i would say first night let, let's let's do our retention level more uh, in the covid period i had a time where uh, the the first week we launched our pharma facility and exactly after a month we got completely locked down nobody knew what the sop would be what is the next step i think week 4 days we we collaborated with all the regulators all check nagas were open and uh, rather i would be very openly say that we are the first airport to allow the pharmaceuticals and all products 24 by 7 so we we that that's that's where the vision came in and you know really re really the regulators supported they came on front and really supported us so uh, and then vaccine distribution came another challenge came almost 96 countries we exported the vaccines i do remember the first flight when it came there was a lot of emotions uh, there were so many um, uh, amb uh, ambassador from different countries they were crying on the tarmac you know uh, they said you guys are not having vaccine on your shoulder but you're giving to our countrymen and they were hugging and you know they were trying to uh, show their feelings that's how the country has really come up and it's all because ministry of civilization of course keku was also leading from the front from supporting from the moka you know and we had i don't think so we have uh, slept a single day you know we have got nine uh, groups of uh, whatsapp group covering all aspects i am the nodal officer for mumbai i do remember it would, the challenge was there and hats off to the freight forwarders also consolidators big bulk agents 6000 tons of cargo was lying so what i'm trying to tell is commodity shift is uh, a time where we are in a comfort zone we still not in a comfort zone we are trying to capture and consolidate our thing which is gone man gone into the ocean freight uh, i'll i'll tell you one example of uh, uh, there are 16 countries in the world and uh, you will vouch for it which he mentioned about nokia these kind of changes will keep coming in next 6 months to 8 months mark my words our prime minister is not going just for sake of all across the world he's traveling all across there is a strategy in place this is all for our countrymen to really develop and this is a super golden opportunity that's where everyone every ministry is on toes trying to everyone has more than 100 actionable points i think we all have to really shoulder to shoulder work together on that i'll give you an example before i end up on my for topic on this uh, there are there are good exporters uh, there are good chamber of commerce across the globe who are trying to connect our chambers for putting manufacturing unit in india at a one tenth of the cost and it will be driven by our indian exporters that's where the vision is i will talk about one one example not to name the country and not name the exporter the sanitary napkin which is basically you know there are only two or three branded players across india who is distributing across 60% of population of women are still not using it the country is saying we will we will give you all units all across 10 units across india you do manufacture and the cost will be not even 3 rupees per and that 3 rupees will again go to the csr so that's where the vision, there is a huge opportunity And the content it's a very low cost but even not for india consumptions but also to the african 54 countries in the continent they would like to export and then that's where the vision is here is an opportunity we are taking care of the people of our country and also exporting so th there are there are such such examples where i think we have to go practically and deep grab those opportunities because otherwise they will go to bangladesh or they go to sri lanka or they'll go to any other manufacturing units so today we are in a very very positive note where when i talk about mumbai as an airport what i see uh, the growth has been on automobile auto components your pharma has been you know the sustainable product which is keep on growing but i feel uh, i have to retain those i i, I fear that this might also go into the ocean more and for collaboratively i think the cargo industry has to work together on this great so collaboration is the key and it's good to know that you know there are small and medium size companies you know if if, if thane could have 600 of them you know imagine what india holds and and they all will use air freight at some stage so even if we lose a few products to ocean we'll still get all more for all the all the guys who are who are the basically the industry best small players 
are innovative production houses. Yeah. I've I've come across a few of them. Let me go to Camilo. Uh, I hope he's still still awake. Camilo, hi. Hey, perfect. So so just wanted to understand from you, you know, with all these fast moving changes from manufacturing uh, for a movement of raw materials, storage of goods, you know, how do you see that the world of logistics is uh, adopting to a world which is so unpredictable? Well, Josh, I, I think as a as a logistics as an air freight. Um, industry, we should not only feel proud for what we did for the global uh, society in the past two years, but also feel very proud of the speed of adoption that as an industry we have had around technology and digitization. Let me share with you a couple of statistics that we measure here at, at Freighters. Um, currently, 40% of the global air freight capacity is now available for online bookings. 46% of airlines are offering instant rate searches, and 33% of the airlines are offering instant confirmation bookings. If we go back to 2019, that 46% was 10%, and the 33% of uh, e-booking capabilities was 25%. So in just the space of two years, the industry has been able to adopt and embrace technology in a, in a way that perhaps previously would have taken us five or seven years. So what we're seeing, and it, this is for, for the space of 24 months, but what we're seeing here is that it's even faster nowadays. The speed is, is faster, but not only in, in terms of adopting that technology, but in terms of embracing change from an industry perspective. If I go back uh, two or three years in, in our meetings with players, forwarders of airlines in the industry, we would spend several meetings in trying to convince them about the need and the benefits of technology and digitization. That was the reality. Nowadays, I would say that in the first 5, 15 minutes of the meeting, we have covered that topic. We no longer need to convince any of the stakeholders of the relevance of digitization and technology. We have moved from an era where digitization was a mandatory chapter in the business plan for a company to making sure that nowadays technology and digitization are at the core of the business plan. We firmly believe that companies who will have the best future are those who are going to embrace technology from the very top. And on this topic, I would leave two messages. One, we do not see digitization and technology as an IT project. That is one way to look at it. But personally, that is not the one that will guarantee the long-term benefits and sustainability. Digital transformation and, dig and technology transformation needs to come from the CEO and to every single employee in the company. And that should be reflected in the corporate culture of the organization. We often see players that come up with very bright and flashy front-end systems. And they claim that they have transformed their business, that they are a digital business. We even get customers who would claim that they don't need any of our services because they are already a digital player. When we try to scratch a bit the surface, it comes up that they are now communicating among teams through WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. And that's how they claim that they have transformed the industry. So the front end is important, but we need to design processes that support that front end from a digital perspective. And every employee of every organization in the logistics industry needs to breathe digitization and technology if we want to have a bright future as the one I think we can. And there's no other reason to that, that the fact that, as I said earlier, logistics and air freight are another component of the global economy. I would not personally imagine myself going back to visiting travel agencies in order to buy tickets. Travel agencies still exist, and those who exist do very well. They're very profitable, but with one key difference to comp compared to what a travel agent was 20 years ago. They are dedicated to adding value to the passenger. So with that, I would say technology and digitization are not here to replace human relationships. We're here to support human relationships. 
to allow the human component of your organizations to focus on value adding activities. Let's leave the transaction, the low value added activities to technology. There's room for everyone here. Perhaps the only ones who should, if something fear about technology and digitization are the ones who do not want to embrace it. They are the ones who are going to see how others are gonna fast uh, approach them very fastly and overtake them even faster. So um, again, go back to my, my beginning um, opening here. Very proud of the speed of adoption. It's still taking place. We need to do a lot. If we look at the Indian market, we have deployed a, a big team uh, in, in this market. We believe in the capabilities and the future of the Indian market. The vision for 2030 is aligned to what we see is, is this, that this market is capable to do, but we need to work together. And previously I was talking about sharing and Josh, you've spoken about it also. In two aspects, I mentioned it. First, you do not need to buy everything. In terms of technology, software, Many options are out there without the need of very uh, high capital expenditure. And secondly, you do not need to develop every IT solution. Let's leave experts to develop the IT solutions. Let each of us focus on what we're best at. And together, if we are able to forget about that silo mentality, together through the right way of collaborating, we will be even stronger going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Camilo. Uh, yes, of course, technology is going to always play an important role. And what you said is a, a top down approach of uh, implementation of technology or digitalization of business is very important. It's not an IT team's job to, to make sure there's a transformation in the organization. It's the CEO's job. So we get the CEOs who, who understand that it's their job. Let me let me go over to Keku and ask him, you know, because uh, before we get into technology, you know, once we get down that lane, there's no coming back. So I'll just hold it there because luckily he's virtual, he's not here. Otherwise, he would have just gone down straight that lane. So, you know, the, uh, you know, deployment of capacity, being an airline, deployment of capacity must be a big challenge with, the, you know, so much of uh, ups and downs, so much of world changes that are happening. Suddenly, a country goes into lockdown and, and a country gets into extensive or, a, or, you know, a territorial issue that we are seeing in the CIS now. So how does an airline deploy capacity and you know meet the or meet the expectations of the demand of the customers? Well, thank you, Yash. So the common saying in our industry is capacity is as perishable as perishable can be. The moment the aircraft door closes, that's the end of your capacity, you stand and gone. So making use of every available uh, square centimeter of space on the planet container or the world is the need of the art. How do airlines deploy capacity? It's, it's the same demand and supply uh, relationship that has been there for donkey years. What has changed over time has only been the accessibility to this capacity. And COVID has, in a way, shown how capacities can either be deployed or withdrawn in a matter of hours. Okay. When the lockdown was announced, it was a day, and you had flights coming down. Imagine the amount of cargo that was at the terminals, waiting to go, in the air, waiting to land, in the factories, waiting to be produced, in the farms, waiting to be harvested. Capacities will and will always remain a challenge to balance out between the needs. As I mentioned earlier, what's important is forecasting. The, the, the technology that you would have in your hand to forecast demand, and demand, when I mean demand, is demand in advance for capacities, is something that you are going to be the winner of. Those were the days where you had a Chinese New Year and you had different capacity, or you had aviation, you had aircraft that are going in for heavy maintenance, so capacities were pulled down, etc. We know all that. We know when the Chinese year is going to come. We know when holidays are going to come. We know when demand is going to come. Today, it's boiling down to exactly to the day of the week for which capacities need to be entertained. Having said that, it's also very important for us to understand that there is a cost element to a capacity. 
And this cost element is something that uh, very few of us pay attention to. I'm, de I'm differentiating between the cost of the product as an exporter, the logistics cost of the product, and of the logistics cost, I'm trying to segregate what is the airplane cost. These are three independent separate costs that we need to understand about. A lot of times we mix up this three and it gives us the implication that the air freight cost is very high. Sorry, it isn't. And I, I can say that with all authority after being in this industry for, for 33 years, it isn't. It, it's a big misnomer. What you're getting is value for money. The same value for money is coming to or is required by the airline as well. Remember, this is a very asset heavy industry. The airlines are a very, very asset heavy, asset expensive industry. Forget just fuel, forget lease costs, forget uh, ground handling costs. The most cost of insurance of a hull today of an aircraft is mind blowing. Now, add to that the warrant insurances that international airlines have to pay for flying over, let's say, Ukraine, etc. You've seen during the first half of the war when capacities were brought down, some of the destinations did not fly. Some of the US carriers did not come to India. Not because they did not have business, not because there was no cargo, but it simply was unbargained for them to fly bypassing their original route. Almost all carriers fly over the North Pole to get to US. Almost all, including India, including any carrier. Now you cut out that airspace. What do you get? Which way do you want to go? All right. And every extra mile that you fly, you burn X amount of tons of fuel to get to that place. I can go on and on. This it, 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 uh, it's sensitive, but let's let's respect the capacity that is deployed, and more important, let's utilize the capacity that is deployed. I can still tell you on a lot of capacity that are deployed in the country, both domestic and international, it is not even 60% occupied. I'm repeating again, it's not even 60% occupied. So there is some capacity out there. You need intelligent planning to see how you can do it. Those were the days where you wanted to have a direct flight for various reasons. But today they are extremely intelligent technologies both uh, real-time as well as planned, that can optimize routes for you, not necessarily being a direct flight. And that is something that is going to define the way forward as we go to. Fantastic, sir. Fantastic. Yes, very interesting that we're still talking very much about, uh, you know, how could we collaborate and use the available capacities when 40% of capacity is still available and unutilized then uh, why are we asking for more? Let's let's make sure that you know whatever is available is definitely used. I'm going to have two last questions because we're running out of time, and you know I'll request you to you know keep it to 60 to 90 seconds each. Uh, so Vasu, to you, you know, since we are on technology, and you know I told you once we go down this lane, there is no coming back. So as much as I wanted non-tech, uh, but we got into technology. <laughs> so you know how well do you see the stakeholders in the air cargo? Since you're you know sitting on the outside, and how do you how well do you see the stakeholders in our industry actually adopting technology and will the adoption in the true sense actually impact the cost and efficiency? No, 60, think, to uh, 60, being, 60 to 90 seconds please. Yeah, I think uh, firstly, I think yes, you're being unfair to people who've adopted technology in a big way. So I think people have already started on that journey long back. I think the problem is in connecting the dots today. For example, even if you talk of customs 24 by 7 and we've been speaking of EDI for I think many, many years and who is nodding his head, so I don't have to say anything more. I'm just saying, look at, look at how the best airports, even if they are small, handling the whole process. Everybody is talking about process, not infrastructure. And most of it is enabled by technology. In fact, there will be more role of technology in the future. We know that in some of these airports, there is one person who handles the entire AWB process. And we spoke about it uh, yesterday also. Why can't that happen in India? Because somewhere, the link is broken. Everybody has his own, uh, you know, view on uh, technology and the resources to deploy it. But somewhere the dots are not connected. And maybe this is one point which has to go across to the ministry. At least make sure that the links are working fine. Or ensure that, you know, you have one stakeholder who is in complete charge of that. That's one. 
Two is just going back to uh, Keku's point, a little departure from technology. I think he's very right. In fact, I was looking at some interesting stats about total ATMs flying out of airports today. And we know that traffic has come back in a big way. And Bangalore, and I know some people are here from Bangalore and I come from that city, is probably the only airport which has shown that, you know, cargo can be handled post-COVID with a lot more gusto than what they did pre-COVID as well. And probably they've beaten their pre-COVID numbers there. Now, which means that somewhere if you actually find a solution to managing the routing or the utilization of belly space, and that's what is important. There are so many ATMs in all airports that only double as we build more capacity. Is there a method to the madness where we can actually find a way to utilize that belly space well? And which means you solve half the problem on even costs. Because today when you fly empty bellies on certain routes, that cost gets loaded somewhere on the next consignment, right? So we want to avoid that. So I think, I think there are other innovative ways of actually looking at managing the supply. And I'm a firm believer, and everybody has seen this in uh, many sectors, that you create the capacity, especially in uh, the air, air freight business, you will automatically find demand. Connecting the dots, that's the trick. So yeah, we all work with individual ERP systems and you know our own silos. Uh, all we need to do is API integrate into each of, each of us and we have the answers to whatever everybody needs. Just the final question to you, the customer here on the panel that, you know, what are your expectations from logistics industry? Cost ni kam karengam, baki. I think logistic industry can really do, my expectations are, as an exporter, I've been in this business for 35 years. The pinch that we have suffered like two years, of course, has been so much in handling the cargo, in sending out and satisfying our customers. So while the government has been there, and I have been in the business, have been enjoying at one point of time, if all of you remember, for promoting exports, we used to get a lot of things, including the air freight subsidy also. Today, when we go to Mr. Piyush Goel, the Commerce Minister, he says, please do not ask for anything, but I will give you infrastructure support. Here, I would like to say that on logistic front, I do not want a fish, I want a fishing rod. I want that at the back of me, the, all of you need to be given some kind of a hand holding in bringing, you know, freighters from abroad, making it an open sky, this thing, or, you know, evaluating why there are not many operators coming. Why the space is not available? Why are the, of course, yes, told me not to talk about price, but you see, if the, the capacity is there, more competition is there, definitely it will bring down the prices on its own. So my expectation is that the logistic industry has got to be really becoming, in order to make us cost efficient, you have a very important role at the same time. And in making you very cost efficient, I think there needs to be at least, at least for this one year, which is post-COVID, and they are all talking about there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So the light should be shown to all of us. I think government is talking very big. This year, I don't think even the sea freight has gone so high, the air freight has gone so high. It is becoming very, un very, very difficult for uh, the manufacturers to cope up with the imports and export freight charges. So which is, again, adding on to the cost. And apart from it, to make the manufacturing really worthwhile, the time loss, which I said, skill, scale, and speed, I mean to say the speed still is seen. As he has been talking, there is still a lot, lot of waste of time at various uh, places. And as Honorable Minister said, when he was a Commerce Minister, I was interacting with him, transaction cost is still very high. We have got to be really re-looking into it. And as a Commerce Minister, when he was talking, even talk, talking about weather today, we have, while he was a minister, we have been analyzing the transaction cost. The cost of transaction is very high, even in case of logistics, the clearance charges, the in-road charges, the transporting a cargo from one place to another, the storage charges, all have got to be re-evaluated, seen and make us cost efficient. See, the basic key is, out of all this, maybe it's the last question or final question, we have been, and all of us are in agreement, all the panelists are in agreement, that here is an opportunity for India, but all of us are in agreement to one point, we have to be cost efficient. We have to be really efficient to grab this global opportunity of you know, supply chain when India is being looked upon. 
why should we not so let it not be on, only on the papers or in deliberations it should be in reality and i think we can all by collaborating by being very serious about all these things by being you know proactively involved as uh, cyrus was saying that even in i think the gati shakti and the other scheme of the government you are also a part of it and where you are having i think what's that scheme there is another scheme which government has launched for logistic industry so you know what's that no ha huh? no no there is the, the multi you live you live yeah now in that you live the, there are a lot of incidents where i think you as an association can participate and take these words of ours forward and i think minister is already interacting in making it ulip ulip the idea of the ulip is beyond that that is that you are so i think the ulip needs to be really relooked into and i think more a uh, hand holding needs to be done for logistic industry thereby it will affect us so I, as i said unless we manufacture more you will not flourish unless you give us very good service so it is you know a give and take kind of a relationship with these words i would say that it's very impressive to be here today and i think together we will work and together that slogan which i was reading here together we together can we will make it happen thank you so much thank you uh, i've got my mic so so thank you very much sir as much as i didn't want him to talk about cost but uh, it so happens but yes of course you know cost will make us more competitive around the world we need to be most cost effective we need to be efficient in terms of i i do understand your pain when you talk about uh, certain inefficiencies where you know movement from hinterland uh, into the ports and airport sometimes takes far greater time than it takes in some of the other parts of the world i think that's where the logistics efficiency can set in that if we can make that transition faster from the point of produce to possibly where it's carried as a as a gateway whether it's air ocean or probably even through land if that transition we could make faster we will make our product more efficient i think in terms of the the cost of logistics is pretty similar to most parts of the world most advanced parts of the world the big difference between india and some of the advanced economies of the world is the time that it takes from production to the ports airports and vice versa as well so that's that's uh, what it is i think we had a great uh, discussion uh, we've been uh, you know trying to compete with china we are at 400 billion exports there are 3 trillion exports uh, you know uh, apparel they are 7 to 8 times the apparel exports that we do they are 40 times the uh, electronics exports that we do so we have a big elephant there they have more to le- lose and of course we have we can only go further uh, some of the industries like apparel and textiles if you add a billion dollars of exports it it creates 150000 jobs so you know in india when when i think when the minister was talking of you know we looking at at the top of the s curve and leaving the bottom behind uh, is something that we don't need to do we need to ensure that you know we are a 1.4 billion people country we need to take care of everybody we need to take everybody together so it's not just the people in this room but it's the people down there who we need to create jobs for opportunities for indians are great entrepreneurs i think we all great workers we are and we just need slight little bit of uh, steering from the government we will stimulate and we'll scale and we'll galvanize our growth so thank you gentlemen it was great interacting with all of you um can i get some online questions are you going to give me time or you keep here to kill me i whatever you are the chairman can i can i take questions or no how many i i don't know i want to do online questions i don't want to ask them they were sleeping <laughs> there is somebody there who wants to ask a question so just please hand over a mic to him yeah hello it's not a just a question i am from i am supender from ruda so i would like to add my experience what we had and what mr gajdar was saying it was very interesting and i could not uh, resist myself i think when we were talking about the capacity so capacity building i think real test came into the this last two years 22nd of march 2020 when the first day was of your lockdown all over the country so we stopped the airlines our own six aircraft for two days and then we were thinking what to do that we were there at that time thought of hero to hero story for those two days and then what happened we took courage within 48 hours and have we had flown our first first flight from bombay to calcutta 
and we were having very small cargo on that. Within two days, two flights were full. That is from Bombay via Delhi to Calcutta, and similarly Calcutta, Delhi, and Bombay, and Bangalore, and Chennai. And let me tell you very clearly and very honestly, within four days, by the end of March, we were going full for the four aircraft. And then within another two, three days, it was all the six flights where we, we had flown during the night. Yes, it is a very tedious question, how to build that. But we as a blue dot, since we are having experience since 1996, we are having two kinds of products. One is your documents, another is ATA airport to airport. Airport to airport, which is always guessing. And it was the last product which we fill it. So naturally at that time during panic it was no ATA. We were not carrying it that time, but all door to door. Right. Of right. course, many things for Boca. And I think when we are having the airlines, commercial airlines going full, means we are having extra than our capacity, we try to add the other airlines. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank so that's you. The kind of Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you. Thank you. It's definitely, uh, you know, good players like yourself and we need more operators. That's what we heard from Mr. Motila. We need more operators around in the country who could operate capacity so that we could have uh, more in and outs, more domestic movements, faster movement of goods around. So, any more questions? Sorry, I couldn't sit anymore. So, we start dancing. What? Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Please. <laughs> okay, the question is again to uh, Modigalbi. You mentioned about the high cost. Uh, cost is my favorite thing. <laughs> so, I was just wondering, I mean, is the cost high only from India or is it a global kind of phenomenon as of now? Globally, the cost is very high. So, are you saying the exporters in India are at the level playing field across the globe, right? Yes, you're right. As of now, today. So, yes, I do agree that we need to control the cost, but I just want you to defend that the cost of logistics in India is absolutely rock bottom. It is not even 8% which the government recently announced. I would even argue it is less than 5 percent. So, we are still good in terms of logistics cost. Inefficiencies, yes, I agree. We still have the scope of improvement. I think product to product, the cost would differ, of course. Uh, from each product, depending on the value of the goods, uh, it would make all the difference. We can clarify that, you know, ACFI did a full exercise, and on the air trade, when you take the CF value, we are, in India, we are anywhere between 1 to 8 percent. So that's the cost of logistics on air trade fish, considering the CIF value. That's purely on the movement of goods, not keeping any storage in, in, in task. Anybody else? Any questions? Sir, last, absolute last. Uh, just a question to the gentleman uh, online. Kill, 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 kill. Uh, you shared a very interesting figure of 40% uh, of the rates are available online in the carrier. And 60% booking is that Is that true or is it global? Uh, Sorry, just, just repeat your question, sir. Basically, during uh, the conversation, you mentioned that uh, the airline's rates are 40% online available and 60% uh, booking is done instant. Is it true? I mean, globally? I, I think he was referring to passenger at that time. Camilo, was, am I right? I, Can you please repeat the, the, the question? I, I cannot hear. Camilo, uh, uh, Mr. Jain wants to know that you mentioned in your address that. 40% of current bookings around the world are happening online. He's asking the, that the statement was that 40% of the global capacity is now available online. Oh, so up to 40% of the global capacity could be booked online. It's not necessarily all being booked online, but it's already available. You are having to pay, right? Trade. Yes, air freight rates. Air freight rates and uh, capacity. Capacity. Right? Okay, thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, sorry, that was not that was not Bollywood. <laughs> so, it was anybody just in, just in case anybody was sleeping. So, thank you very much, gentlemen. Mucho gracias, Camilo, for uh, being a part of our show.
great to have you guys and great energy that you brought i think the coffee did the trick that you didn't go to sleep but otherwise mai hu na <laughs> thank you ms lock thank you so kemal okay, saab over thank you yash thank you gentlemen just a moment we'd like to honor you uh may i request mr ravindra sethi if he's uh, yeah he's there sir if you'd be kind enough to help us out here uh uh by the way camilo uh, your uh, plaque is coming to you uh, so uh, so we would not be able to give you now but it is coming thank you very much yes i was sitting on the last row got some good news for you i looked around nobody is <laughs> so my job is eating. He's not going out of town. Here's the bad news: has nothing to do with you. But these guys are <laughs> no, absolutely brilliant. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. बस वही रह गया पूछो ग्रासियस मिलो थैंक यू वेरी मच हैव अ ग्रेट डे एंड आई गेट यू इफ यू कमिंग टू मुंबई आई कैरी योर प्लाक Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, there is a slight change of role. Parul uh, had to take a flight, and she's gone. It's come to me. So uh, there are a couple of things left. One is uh, we like to honor our uh, sponsors. Uh, if I could, I request Cyrus. Where is he? Cyrus, please, if you'd be kind enough to come here. Yeah. Uh, may we request uh, Vis Freight, Satish? Uh, Dial, who is here from Dial? Anybody from Dial? Yeah, he's there. Yeah, please, please, please. Abdullah, you are there? Yeah, please come up.
Vadwaji, I'm not calling you, I'm calling KJ. So, KJ, if you'd be kind enough. He is the future, yes, he is. Uh, anyone from Concord Group? Yeah. Prediman, you are there? Prediman is not there. I think, no, Abdullah. I think then Rajiv. Ari Rogers. Skyways. Blue Dart. Oh, Sharmaji. Yeah, we pass. No, no, he's giving it to you. Blue dot, JM, you're here. Ah, yeah, sorry. Concord group is there. Vinji, okay. better get the. Uh, better get the. Uh, black for blue card. The next time we'll, we won't get the lunch. <laughs> blue card. Thank you very much for the lunch sponsors. We are looking. For, we are looking for this trophy. So I think we better get it first. Otherwise, we won't get lunch next time. Air India Sats. Air India Sats. Menzies. Uh, you know, I just want to thank Ravinder City. When I sent him the uh, note for sponsorship, he was in Australia. And even from Australia, he said, I'm having a holiday in Australia. You're not working, right? So, from there, I got a reply, Cyrus, 
confirm sponsorship and that's the support we are looking for so thank you very much ravinder i know all of the sponsors have really done such a great job we without the sponsors we would not be able to have we would not be able to have this event in fact in my opening speech i made the sponsors the production house right they were the producers of this whole event and thank you very much and i thank also all the sponsors okay ravinder will double it for you sir india sats uh menzies aviation boba rajiv you were here zeal global zeal global vishal you are here Primus Partners Private Limited. Ah, uh, shall be Delhi Terminal, so I'll have to go. Pail, Pratik, you are here. Chala gaya. So Sagar, perhaps you could deliver this uh, to Pratik. Yeah. Ha. Oh, oh, pail. Hans. Uh, Hans. Huh? Sorry. Have you given trainers for Dana sir? Avia Pro. Flexi World. Thomas Global Thomas Global Thomas Global are you here Ah there you are S gate Thank you S gate you've done a nice job Logistics insider your logistics insider yeah please come
Thank you very much. Uh, just one more. Uh, we'd like to inform you that uh, uh, ACFI has a skill development program whereby we train uh, a lot of uh, youngsters in our trade. The idea is to train them and, and get them to job in our industry. So we have two types of courses, basic cargo awareness program, advanced uh, air cargo training program, and our chairman, uh, uh, Mr. Vipin Jain, has done a wonderful job. We have trained uh, nearly uh, 3,980 students so far. And uh, we thought it is, and it is all India, it is Pan India that we are training. And this initiative is uh, recognized by MOCA. And we did this uh, in 2015 when Ministry of Civil Aviation accepted these courses. Uh, we thought it is good time to honor the trainers who go out of their normal working times to, to do these courses. Some of them are not in Delhi. So although there are 15 names, but I'll take all 15 names. Whoever is here, please, uh, please come on stage. We'd like to honor you. Um, Vipinji is here. Thank you, Vipinji. Yes, Thank you. Uh, Mr. No, we did. How do we go? Uh, may I request uh, Sharma ji, Vadwa ji, and Cyrus to please uh, honor the trainers who are here. Sharma ji, you will sir, please. This is what you have to do, sir. So, we are honoring our trainers with a stall and uh, a plaque. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Anil Pandya is here. He is the General Manager of Operations, GSEC. Dhyan Sai Vadwaji. Anupam Mishra, I saw you. Where are you? Ah, again. Okay. Anupam Mishra. Yeah, I know. You're going? Okay. Mr. Raj Sharma. Mr. Raj Sharma. Hey, unka ho Mr. Mr. Raj Sharma, you're here? Sir, aap kahan ja rahe ho? Mr. Raj Sharma. Mr. Bhavani Singh, you are here? Yeah, he is here. Mr. Upal Kanti Das. Mr. Harpreet Singh. Sanjeev. Ratan to I but we'll say Ratan Yan. Ratan, are you here? Ah there. Oh lovely. Ratin Rawal uh, 
मिस्टर सागर कथुरी Uh, may we have a photograph with all of you trainers and thank you very much for the time that you take out to train our people this is very nice of you all Thank you. I just thought we'll thank all the trainers. Sharma ji, I hope you are okay. Sharma ji, he's okay. Thank you very much. A round of applause for Sharma ji also. <laughs> the trainers have given the selfless time. They have given complete voluntary, no monetary consideration, and uh, so many times. Uh, Anupam, where is he? He's 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 so passionate. He's driving to some place in the hills, and he's giving a training course from there. I must say. what super support the trainers have given us acfi is so motivated by your good gesture and thank you very very much for yours all the best thank you saris uh, may i now request uh, mr arun kumar board member uh, acfi to say the uh, thank you note uh, vote of thanks thank arun all yours good evening ladies and gentlemen uh he says the best for the last so here i am and i have a long long speech to give so please bear with me at the ounce at the outset i would like to thank the organizers of this event for giving me this opportunity to propose the word of thanks on this momentous occasion of acfi event 2022 i feel honored and privileged to put all the gratitude into words i see a lot of empty seats people have probably left good they did otherwise they would have to listen to my boring speech once a great man whispered th uh, feeling thankful and not expressing it is like wrapping a gift and not giving it on behalf of acfi board all members of acfi on my personal behalf i convey my regards and hearty thanks to our chief guest shri sindhya honorable minister of civil aviation for his gracious presence by taking precious time out of his busy schedule and addressing the gathering we thank our guest shri piyush srivastav ji senior Ad economic advisor ministry of civil aviation who was who has graced this occasion and has encouraged us with his words of wisdom and guidance I want to convey my sincere thanks to all the distinguished members of ACFI, the distinguished delegates from the entire air cargo fraternity who have joined this event from many parts of India and abroad, and participated in question answer sessions. I think I was the one asking a lot of questions. You all gave your valuable time, which is a precious gift to us. We thank all our distinguished speakers from India and abroad. for the three business sessions for a gracious presence and for sharing their perspective on themes of respective business sessions i wish to express my sincere thanks to our moderators shri balla ji sanjeev edward who was injured and yet he made it a point to come and do his uh, his particular session 
uh, Mr. Yashpal Sharma, who's always there, for, st for stimulating the prospective business, uh, respective business sessions, extracting the most out of from the speakers and giving the best to the audience. Also, thank uh, Ms. Parul, who's left for now, for keeping us all together. As always, we remain grateful to our valuable sponsors, without whom the event would not be possible. We convey our sincere thanks to all to the support and contribution to the success of this event. We look forward to continued patronage in the future endeavors of ACFI. I have to say that because next time we do the event, we require more sponsors, right? Okay. I wish to thank the office bearers of the various air cargo supply chain logistics industry associations for their gracious presence at the ACFI event. A sincere thanks to Cargo Print and Electronic News Media for their presence and wish for their excellent coverage of the event in the upcoming publication. The backbone of any association is the Secretariat. Mr. Pradeep, Mr. Brijesh, Dr. Joel, that we call him fondly, he is not Dr. Joel, Dr. Joel, <laughs> and our TG, Mr. Kunwar, have worked relentlessly on this event from the conceptualization to completion. The board of ACFI sincerely thanks. Thank you for your contribution. Most importantly, would like to thank the organizing team of this event. Oh, oh you there. Okay. <laughs> of the event. The members of ACFI task pillar of event management under the able chairmanship of Sri Arvind Agarwal. Sir Rupa Rajav, please come on top. And the mentor, Mr. Yashpal. For steering this meticulously for steering and meticulously planning and execution of this magnific magnificent event. <laughs> okay. No, so the entire team, on behalf of the entire team, we thank you both. Uh, we also thank the entire team of Skyways for supporting this event throughout. So, uh, by, uh, <laughs> okay. And lastly, thank to all the office bearers and board members of ACFI under the leadership of our President Sri Cyrus Katgara for consistent guidance and continuous support of the team of ACFI Task Pillar for Event Management for making this event memorable. Uh, I would like to invite the ACFI Secretariat, uh, uh, Joelji, Kunoji, Joelji, Brijesh, Brijesh and Pradeep, Ladies and gentlemen, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for this team. They have worked really hard to make this event possible and make it in such a brilliant way. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Today, my words may not be enough to express our gratitude. And we in ACFI, once again, thank you very much. Please take care. Be healthy. And... All the best. Thank you.